spring break is over and we are back to work guys um hope you enjoyed your time off i know i did the first of that week was absolutely beautiful and i'm not even gonna lie i spent a lot of time on my porch uh, in the swing with a good book um did some yard work um reworked some rose beds and um just enjoyed being out in the sunshine and the heat um took the husband for some jeep rides and um we just it, it was good but we are back to work this week um and we are starting a new book so i am excited about this book it um i think you're going to really enjoy it. it this book should take us all the way to the end of the school year um and um I will say that the characters are rich in the book, not money rich, but um, rich in depth of the person, the people that they are. Um, our book is Roll of Thunder, Hear My Cry. It is written by Mildred Taylor. And I think that in fourth grade that you guys did a book by Mildred Taylor with Miss Hensley and I think it's um, something to do about trees. Let me see if I can, in the front of our book, let's see, Song of the Trees. That's the one that you all did with Mildred Taylor. It ha This book has the same characters as that particular book, and it just continues to follow their life on. There is another one um, that we have um, that I've read of hers. It's called Let the Circle Be Unbroken. And that one takes the story even further. It talks about the kids in the story as they get older and what their lives become. So <clears throat> when we finish this one, I'll go back and tell you what um, the accompanying book is called again in case it's something you want to do on Audible Books. Um, or if it's one you want to download onto a digital device. But if you're like me, I need a hard book. So many books we can download on our devices now, but there's nothing like having that written piece in my hand, and it gives me great joy. <laughs> Drives my husband crazy because even if I do a, a digital download, I still want the book. And um, and he just thinks that's the craziest thing ever, but we don't care what he thinks about that kind of stuff. So you should have your Roll of Thunder Hear My Cry book, um, and you should have your Team Talk out. Um, for this book, um, when I'm labeling these and you found it, so you, you knew to look under Roll of Thunder, um, I will be doing them, um, I'm not going to name them Stay at Home Day, blah, blah, Stay at Home Day, da, da. Um, it worked great the last time, but I'm just going to be really honest with you. That's my vocabulary words that fell on the floor. Um, is that we have been home for a while, and I cannot remember what Stay at Home Day we are on at this point. So, I'm going to be calling them um, Kim Dunn. I'm looking on my paper here. Roll of Thunder, Team Talk Day 1. Tomorrow will be Roll of Thunder, Team Talk Day 1, Part 2. Wednesday will be Kim Dunn, Roll of Thunder, Team Talk Day 2. Because you know your Team Talks are all labeled as Team Talk Day 1, Team Talk Day 2. But we know that it's taking us at least two days to get through each Team Talk Day. So... That's, I just thought it might be a little easier for me. I mean, you know, I'm just going to be honest to keep track of what they're called that way. So, just keep that in mind. And this should be the last title change that we do at this point. Let me pick this up real quick. This is my giver. I'll need that when I do the other class. Let me set it there. So, kind of want to move into our lesson at this point. Um, want to look at our vocabulary words. I'm going to kind of stand to the side. Hello. Um, we have amably, which is a word that I don't think I have ever used in real life. 
Um, but amably means to be done kindly. So amably is kindly. Loitering is hanging around with no purpose. And I know that you've gone into stores that have the signs that say no loitering. Um, and that means that if you ain't buying something, you need to go. So loitering is hanging around with no purpose. Dismissed is sent away. And um, when I was a kid um, and we would go to my mama's house and like for, let's say a special occasion, whether it's 4th of July or Christmas or um, a homecoming or a reunion, um, the kids were always dismissed from the house or dismissed from adults because they didn't want kids being um, nosing around grown-up conversation. So we would be sent away so that the grown-ups could be feel free to discuss the things that they needed to discuss. Collide is smashed together. Um, guys, I know that you all have played Hot Wheels um, and girls too, but we've all set up those Hot Wheel tracks. You know, you can screw them on with that little vice and let them go down and they will collide with other cars or they will collide into something there at the bottom of the hill. Um, so collide is to smash together. Emitted is gave off or sent out. <clears throat> so I think of a skunk when I hear the word emitted because it means gave off. So the skunk emitted a horrendous smell and made me gag. So emitted is telling me that it gave off a bad smell. Um, and so there's where we are with that. Inaccessible means it's impossible to reach. So I have five kids. Um, I'm old now, but when they were all small, I used to set things up on high places that I knew that they would not be able to get things, especially things that I thought that might hurt them or I didn't want them to have. So I made it inaccessible for them to get to those dangerous items. I made it impossible for them to reach it. They weren't tall enough to stretch. They weren't strong enough to pull chairs over to get it. So I knew that it was inaccessible. Defiantly is where it's done with bold resistance. Defiant means you can't make me and or what are you going to do about it kind of attitude. It's kind of got that um, boldness and even though bold is in there, but it's a boldness to it like, yeah, right. And so sometimes in our early teenage years, we will do things defiantly until um, a person of authority kind of shows you what they can do about it, whether it's a type of a punishment of some sort. Um, um, you know, we live in southeastern Kentucky where it's not unusual to get a spanking. Um, it's not unusual for the person that loves you and is taking care of you to say, well, you know what? I pay your phone bill. Give me your phone. And we'll see how much of a bold resistance you're going to keep putting up. You know, give me your electronic devices. I want your game systems. So defiantly is bold resistance until you can be checked. So tolerate is to put up with or withstand. Now, with my five kids, the three, there's a five year gap, five and a half year gap between the older three and the younger two. And those older three really had to tolerate um, those younger two for a while because they would annoy them greatly. Um, when their friends would come over, you would have you know, these young kids that would want to be in the middle of all of their um, friend groups. And so they put up with a lot of crazy stuff. And so tolerate is where you make do. You don't like it, but you just do it. Now, 
our end in mind this week. And I'm gonna pop it down here so we can see it a little easier. And you might wanna write it on your team top. So as you're working on questions and I'm not there, you've kind of got that end in mind um, in front of you. It says, I will be able to identify aspects of the characters. And I love that. So it's plural. So we know we're gonna be looking at multiple characters in our story, not just one, not just the main character. My fifth grade end in mind right now is talking about the main character where we're looking at characters. So we're identifying aspects of the character's thoughts um, through their thoughts, their words, and their actions. Okay, so we're identifying character traits. Really and truly, that's what we're doing. Um, when it says identify aspects of the characters, it's just another way of saying character traits. And we're always using, um, if it's a in the word monologue, that's their thoughts, right? And we all have those. Um, their actions are what they're doing. And then the words are the dialogue that's coming out. And then how are we being able to look at those things to figure out a character trait? Okay, so I'm gonna hang this back up. Now, one of the reasons that I love stories, and I have always been a huge reader, I've always been, um, even as a young child, um, four and five, as soon as I began to read, I would read anything I could get my hands on. But I always read mostly narratives um, because I love the richness of characters um, and the story and those interconnected details that make that story rich and inviting to continue to read. Um, and so, when I think about richness of characters, I want you to think about your favorite story, even if you're not a huge reader, okay? If it's not a book, I want you to think about your favorite movie and pick out one character. And how would you describe that character? Just think about that a moment. I'm gonna get a drink of water. My thoughts instantly go to the Alex Ryder series. Um, and it is an absolutely great series for sixth and seventh graders, I think. Maybe some fifth graders, but I think it really um, speaks to sixth and seventh graders because the main character is 12 to 13 years old when the series begins. <clears throat> and this particular, um, series of books, and I think there's like 11 or 12, um, starts out where <clears throat> this young boy um, lives with his uncle and like a live-in babysitter because his uncle is away a lot with his work and the uncle dies. <clears throat> and then as the young boy is trying to figure out really what happened to his uncle, he stumbles across the the realization that his uncle is a spy, a British spy. And through all of the things that the young boy had to do um, to figure out what his uncle's true vocation was, he was noticed by the same British spy agency. And they coerced him into becoming a young um, kid spy. And each book is going through a different type of um, mission that he has to complete and how he really doesn't want to be a spy, but he can't figure out how to get out. And they're just super good and they're super fast paced. But when I think about Alex Ryder and I think about his actions and I think about his words and his thoughts, through these books, there were a couple of things that really jumped out to me as character traits. One is that he is super intelligent. He's just a smart kid. He knows how to, to take simple um, household items to create 
ways to make explosions or to create ways to escape. Um, he's a quick thinker, <clears throat> excuse me. And what I mean by that is faced with a life and death situation, I would be sitting there going, oh my gosh, I'm gonna die. But he's sitting there and he's trying to figure out, okay, how am I gonna get out of this? What, am I, what do I need to do? Well, I've got this and I've got that and this will work. So he's really a quick thinker. Um, he's a problem solver. And really those two kind of go hand in hand. Um, but he, he, a quick thinker means you gotta do it right now. A problem solver to me means that you've got time to really think about all of the scenarios of things that could go wrong to figure out how you wanna attack it. And the last thing that I, how I would describe him, you know, and I'd be able to identify aspects is that I normally don't like to give physical characteristics when I think about character traits, but um, he's physically fit. He would not be able to do all of the things that are required of him if he had not had years of training. And it talks about that in the first book, how his uncle Ian had made sure that he had always been active, whether it was through um, judo lessons, um, rock climbing, um, that, that, like adventure bike riding. I mean, all, there was all kinds of things that he did that prepared him for some of the strenuous activity that it required of him to get out of some of these tough spots. So when we think about identifying aspects of characters, that, that's all it's asking you to do is to think about one particular character that they're talking about in our story this week. And then you have to ask yourself, okay, are they thinking? Are they talking? Are they doing? Because that's all they're asking. And if they're thinking, what does that tell us about the character? If they're doing, what do their actions tell us? And if they're talking, what does that tell us about that person? So we're gonna practice some of that you know, a little hand holding as we go along at the beginning. But come test day, guys, we all know that this end in mind is the big questions, okay? Now, talking about test, I'm doing this on Saturday. This whole week's worth is to being done on a Saturday. As of this morning, guys, I have um, 22 of you in my class. Um, eight of you had done last week's test. So this afternoon, if I don't have a test from you, you know what I mean by this afternoon, your afternoon on Monday, um, I'm going to have to call and ask your parents where your tests are. I'm going to run delay today, which is Saturday, to make sure that no one had turned them in, um, on a paper copy. And, um, so that I can get a true idea of who's done what. Now, I've not graded any of them. Those of you who are saying, well, I did one and I don't know how I did because it didn't score it right, and it didn't score it right. Um, it scored all the multiple choice, but it was not able to score your extended responses um, because I have to go in and manually score all those myself. I'm on spring break like you lot guys are. So I was not in any hurry to get in there and do three hours worth of scoring or four um, on my week off. So I'll get to them. Um, and I know tomorrow is Easter, but I probably will do some tomorrow um, and try to get the rest of them on Monday. So those of you who did do the test, hopefully you'll have a true score by Monday afternoon. Anyway, so I want us <clears throat> to let's talk about Roll of Thunder, Hear My Cry. This book um, was, that well, let me rephrase that. This book is set in the late 1930s, the early 1940s um, in the deep rural South. Now, in the 1930s, 1940s, 1950s, 1960s, even even onward today, um, African-Americans suffer great um, prejudice. 
But in the early 1900s, it was crazy ridiculous. The injustices that they suffered, the inhumanity that was heaped upon um, this culture of people. Now, even though slavery ended in 1863 by the Emancipation Proclamation, um, that's when the, the formal piece of slavery ending, um, it did not mean that people who were prejudiced had an instant mind shift. That went on. And prejudice is bred, in my opinion, in families. It takes a long time and a very brave person and a strong person to be able to say, you know what? I don't agree with how you think and I don't agree with what you believe and the doctrine that you believe in. And they step back to make a change. So we are what, 60s, 70, 80, 90, 300, 313, 23, 30. So we're about 80 years out of slavery <clears throat> where this story takes place. But <clears throat> the aspect of um, the ugliness and the hatred is still there. And I want to say that because this book really highlights some of the ugliness that went on during this time frame. In this book, there is language that we do not use in today's society. And I won't sugarcoat this language. If we were in a classroom setting, we would be having this same conversation. And one of the things that I always talk about is how there are certain words that we never say. Um, however, those words are oftentimes written in pieces of literature because it goes with the setting and the time of when the story was taking place. And so the big word that is in this book that we do not say is the word nigger. You know, in the classroom, I would tell you when you are partner reading, you do not have to say this word. You can skip it. You can use another word in its place. And I would never want you to do something that would make you feel uncomfortable because it makes us feel uncomfortable because we know that it's inappropriate and we know that it is wrong to use. However, because it fits the timeline of the story, that is why it's written in, into this book. So, want to make sure that you understand that, okay? It's not a word that I want you to start using. It should not become a part of your vocabulary because of the ugliness that is associated with the word, okay? All right. Now, what I'd like us to do is I want us to open our book to page three. And I'm trying to keep um, an idea of time because I do know I'm looking at no more than a 35 minute lesson. So we have 12 minutes. So here we go. Little man, would you come on? You keep it up and you will make us late. My youngest brother paid no attention to me. Grasping more firmly his newspaper wrapped notebook and his tin can lunch of cornbread and oil sausages. He continued to concentrate on the dusty road. He lagged several feet behind my other brothers, Stacy and Christopher John and me, attempting to keep the rusty Mississippi dust from swelling with each step and drifting back upon his shiny black shoes and the cups of his corduroy pants by lifting each foot high before setting it gently down again. Always meticulously neat, Six-year-old little man never allowed dirt or tears or stains to mar anything he owned, and today was no exception. You keep it up and make us late for school, I'm just gonna wear you out, I threatened, pulling with exasperation at the high collar of my Sunday dress that mama had made me wear for the first day of school, as if that event were something special. It seemed to me that showing up at school at all on a bright August like October morning made for running the cool forest trails and wading barefoot in the forest pond was concession enough. Sunday clothing was asking too much. 
Now, Christopher, John, and Stacy were not too pleased about the clothing or school either. Only little man, just beginning his school career, found the prospects of both intriguing. Y'all go ahead and get dirty if y'all want it, he replied without even looking up from his studied steps. Me, I'm gonna stay clean. I bet your mama gonna clean you, you keep it up, I grumbled. Oh, Cassie, leave him be, Stacy admonished, frowning and kicking testily at the road. I ain't said nothing but, Stacy cut me a wicked look and I grew silent. His disposition had been irritatingly sour lately. If I hadn't have known the cause of it, I could have forgotten very easily that he was, at 12, bigger than I, and that I had promised Mama to arrive at school looking clean and ladylike. Shoot, I mumbled finally, unable to restrain myself from further comment. It ain't my fault you've got to be in Mama's class this year. Stacy's frown deepened, and he jammed his fists into his pockets, but said nothing. Christopher John, walking between Stacy and me, glanced uneasily at both of us, but did not interfere. The short, round boy of seven, he took little interest in troublesome things, preferring to remain on good terms with everyone. Yet, he was always sensitive to others, and now, shifting the handle of his lunch can from his right hand to his right wrist, and his smudged notebook from his left hand to his left armpit. He stuffed his free hands into his pockets and attempted to make his face as moody as Stacy's and as cranky as mine. But after a few months, he seemed to forget that he was supposed to be grouchy and began whistling cheerfully. There was little that could make Christopher John unhappy for very long, not even the thought of school. I tugged again at my collar and dragged my feet in the dust, allowing it to sift back into my socks and shoes like gritty red snow. I hated the dress and the shoes. There was little I could do in a dress, and as far as shoes, they imprisoned freedom-loving feet accustomed to the feel of the warm earth. Cassie, stop that, Stacy snapped as the dust billowed in swirling clouds around my feet. Well, I looked up sharply, ready to protest. Christopher John's whistling increased to a raucous, nervous shrill, and grudgingly, I let the matter drop and trudged along in a moody silence, my brothers growing as pensively quiet as I. So, if I think about my ended mind, and I want to think about Cassie. So, we've been introduced, really, to four characters. But Cassie's kind of the one I want to pull out and think about. So from her words and her actions toward little man, I could say that Cassie is short-tempered. And the author is showing me that by how quickly she gets mad at her little brother because she feels like he's walking too slowly even though he has a reason for walking slowly. He don't want to get dirty, and but she doesn't care. She, she's like, you're going to make us late. We're going to get in trouble. Let's get on with it. So she's showing us that she's got this kind of quick temper about her. Let's go back to page six. <clears throat> but as the narrow sun-splotched road wound like a lazy red serpent, dividing the high forest bank of quiet old trees on the left from the cotton field, forested by giant green and purple stalks on the right. A barbed wire fence ran the length of the deep field, stretching eastward for over a quarter of a mile until it met the sloping green pasture that signaled the end of our family's 400 acres. An ancient oak tree on the slope, visibly even now, was the official dividing mark between Logan Land and the beginning of a dense forest. Beyond the protective fencing of the forest, vast farming fields worked by a multitude of sharecropping families covered two thirds of a 10 square mile plantation. That was Harlan Granger's land. <clears throat> so 
during this time frame, here's a history lesson, guys. During this time frame, it was very unusual for African Americans to own even an acre to two acres of land. But Cassie's family owns 400 acres. That is a huge amount of property. Um, and so it was very unusual for this time. The second thing that I want to talk about is it talked about um, sharecroppers <clears throat> and that the land beside them was worked by a multitude of sharecropping families. So sharecroppers were very prominent during this time, especially for um, large old plantations to be able to um, continue producing um, particular types of crops. Sharecroppers for um, a small place to live and a small area to farm on their own. They worked um, in the crops of the land owner and that way to help pay for their rent for a year span of time. Sharecroppers were almost always poor and impoverished. Um, they usually had small gardens that they ate out of and tried to put food up on their own. Might have a small, um, some small types of um, livestock, whether it's chicken or a cow or two. But for the most part, they were just very much having just subsisting living. Um, one of the things about sharecroppers, though, is that they had no real sense of safety of where they were. And what I mean by that is they could be kicked off at any time. Um, they were at the mercy of the landowner. So, once our land had been Granger land, too, but the Grangers had sold it during Reconstruction to a Yankee for tax money. In 1887, when the land was up for sale again, Grandpa had bought 200 acres of it. And in 1918, after the first 200 acres had been paid off, he had bought another 200. And it was good, rich land, much of it still virgin forest. And there was no debt on half of it, but there was a mortgage on the 200 acres bought in 1918. And there were taxes on the full 400. And for the past three years, there had not been enough money from the cotton to pay both and live on too. That was why Papa had gone to work on the railroad. In 1930, the price of cotton dropped. You gotta think in the 30s is when the depression hit the United States. So that made sense that the price dropped. And so in the spring of 1931, Papa set out looking for work, going as far north as Memphis and as far south as the Delta country. He had gone west, too, into Louisiana. It was there he found work laying track for the railroad. He worked the remainder of the year away from us, not returning until the deep winter when the ground was cold and barren. The fall and spring after the planting was finished, he did the same. Now it was 1933, and Papa was again in Louisiana laying track. I asked him once why he had to go away why the land was so important. And he took my hand and said in his quiet way, look out there, Cassie girl, all that belongs to you. Why, you ain't never had to live on anybody's place but your own. And as long as I live and the family survives, you'll never have to. That's important. You may need a, me, you may not understand that now, but one day you will, then you'll see. Well, I looked at Papa strangely when he said that, for I knew that all the land did not belong to me. Some of it belonged to Stacy and Christopher John and Little Man, not to mention the part that belonged to Big Ma, Mama, and Uncle Hammer, Papa's older brother who lived in Chicago. But Papa never divided the land in his mind. It was simply Logan land. For it, he would work the long, hot summer pounding steel. And Mama would teach and run the farm. Big Ma in her 60s would work like a woman of 20 in the fields and keep the house. And the boys and I would wear threadbare clothing washed to dishwater colors. But always, the taxes and the mortgage would be paid. 
Papa said that one day I would understand, and I wondered. And when the fields ended and the granger forest fanned both sides of the road with long overhanging branches, a tall, emaciated-looking boy popped suddenly from a forest trail and swung a thin arm around Stacy. <clears throat> the word emaciated, what do you think that means? And there's a context clue right after that that may help you, emaciated. Emaciated means beyond skinny. It's not like you're just thin. Emaciated usually means that if you took your shirt off that you could see all of the bones going down your spine, that you might would be able to see all of your ribs protruding. So it means that you are more than just skinny. <clears throat> well, it was T.J. Avery and his younger brother Claude emerged a moment later, smiling weakly as if it pained him to do so. Now the boy had on shoes and their Sunday clothing, patched and worn, hung loosely upon their frail frames. The Avery family sharecropped on Granger land. Well, said T.J. jauntily, swinging into step with Stacy, here we go again, starting another school year. Yeah, said Stacy. Aw, oh, man, don't look so down, T.J. said cheerfully. Your mama's really one great teacher, I should know. And he certainly should. He had failed mama's class last year and was now returning for a second try. Shoot, you can say that, exclaimed Stacy. You don't have to spend all day in a classroom with your mama. Look on the bright side, said TJ. Just think of the advantages you got. You'll be learning all sorts of stuff for the rest of us, he smiled slyly. Like, what's on all them tests? Well, Stacy thought TJ's arm, or thrust TJ's arm from his shoulders. If that's what you think, you don't know mama. Ain't no need of getting mad, TJ replied undaunted. Just an idea. And he was quiet for a moment and then announced, I bet you I could give you all an earful about that burning last night. Burning? What burning? asked Stacy. Man, don't y'all know nothing? The berries burning. I thought y'all's grandmother went over there last night to see about them. Well, of course we knew that Big Ma had gone to a sick house last night. She was good at medicines and people often called her instead of a doctor when they were sick. But we didn't know anything about any burns or anything about the berries either. What berries he talking about, Stacy? I asked. I don't know no berries. They live way over on the other side of Smellings Creek. They come up to church sometimes, said Stacy absently. And then he turned back to TJ. Mr. Langer came by real late and got big and Big Ma said Mr. Berry was low sick and needed her to help nurse him. But he ain't said nothing about no burning. He's low sick, all right, because he got burnt near to death, him and his two nephews. And you know who done it? Who? Stacy and I asked together. Well, you know, since y'all don't seem to know nothing, said TJ in his usual sickening way of nursing a tidbit of information to death, maybe I ought not to tell y'all. It might hurt y'all's little ears. Now, that's where we're going to stop today. We're not even going to break questions down. We're going to do that um, when we come back here in just a second. So for the rest of the day, your reading lesson's done, guys. You are good to go. I just got to make myself a note of where I stopped. And I'll see you tomorrow. Enjoy the rest of the day.